Coming up on Chapman News, the U.S. may be hours away from approving its first vaccine. When might you get a shot? Going in the wrong direction, California setting new COVID-19 records. And commemorating a grim anniversary around the world, the Facebook event that has gone viral. From Dodge College of Film and Media Arts, this is Chapman News. Good afternoon and welcome to our final show of the semester. A historic day as the U.S. is just hours away from emergency vaccine approval. This just after reaching the highest daily death toll with over 3,000 lives lost yesterday. The decision comes after several countries have already approved and administered the vaccine. Adriana Ferrari has more. The FDA Vaccine Advisory Panel has formally recommended that the COVID-19 vaccine be authorized for emergency use, a critical milestone in the national vaccine effort. But the FDA's official approval is yet to come. The main factor is that they, the, the FDA and the CDC and other health authorities are considering are definitely safety to, to individuals who are receiving the vaccine and efficacy. Does it actually have coverage uh, and protection against this virus? A glimmer of hope as the world watched 90-year-old Margaret Keenan receive the first COVID-19 vaccine shot outside clinical trials in the world. Keenan was given the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine in Northern Ireland Monday morning, kicking off the UK's effort to deploy vaccines on a large scale outside of clinical trials, the first country in the world to do so. The second person to be vaccinated was a man named William Shakespeare at the same hospital as Keenan. Following the United Kingdom, Canada and Bahrain have also authorized the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine, and the United States is expected to authorize the drug as early as tomorrow. Once that happens, shipments of the vaccine will begin immediately. Both vaccines having this uh, this the status, uh, temporary or emergency approval status, and then the distribution of the vaccine will occur mid to late December. As I understand, the pharmacies, hospitals, and health clinics are all ready. They're having uh, protocols set in place as well as what I hear from hospitals is that they're having kind of like trial runs on how they're going to receive the vaccine from these companies store them, how are they going to distribute them at their site, and which are the people who are going to go first, as we understand the healthcare workers and frontline, work, uh, frontline workers as well. However, doctors are warning that those with severe allergies should avoid the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine after two British patients experience allergic reactions. This has some medical experts worried that the risk of an allergic reaction could deter people. With any new drug development, with any vaccine, there's going to be some people experiencing some more severe or serious side effects. And we, we have to look at those individuals if they have pre-existing conditions as well. Dr. Lam also points out that many frontline workers are among the first to take the vaccine, proving to skeptics that it is safe. You have to look at it in all senses that if we want to set an example of trust, then the frontline workers like myself, the healthcare workers, we're going to go first to let the people know that it is safe. But looking forward, President-elect Joe Biden promising 100 million vaccine shots in the first 100 days of his presidency. He also announced his plans to sign an executive order mandating masks wherever he has the legal authority to do so. I'm Adriana Ferrari for Chapman News. Back to you, Savi. Thanks, Adriana. The vaccine would be coming just in time as hospitals are overwhelmed with new cases. The U.S. has now lost more lives to COVID-19 than during World War II. The country now reporting over 15.6 million cases with more than 292,000 lives lost. The number of people hospitalized with the virus has doubled since November. California among the hardest hit, enforcing another lockdown but not everyone is staying in. Spencer Riley has more. With coronavirus cases surging across California, nearing close to 1.5 million cases and ICUs quickly filling, the state's Department of Public Health has placed restrictions on the highly populated San Joaquin Valley in Southern California regions. We are announcing uh, and introducing a regional stay-at-home order in the state of California, fundamentally predicated on the need to stop gathering with people outside of your household to do what you can to keep most of your activities outside. 
Regional stay-at-home order restricts private gatherings of any size, requiring full masking and physical distancing measures to be taken. The order also closing restaurant doors to any in-person dining. That means many of your favorite restaurants switching to takeout only. But a second shutdown is making orange businesses question whether they can survive. They uh, need to, to stay open in order to feed their families. So I, you know, it's a matter of survival for, for many companies out there. This order is especially detrimental to already suffering mom and pop shops, who argue that being forced to fully rely on takeout and delivery could put them out of business. We're definitely in survival mode um, and, you know, most importantly, keeping our team employed, um, you know, making sure we have enough sales to keep our operating hours. The decision to close restaurants is resulting in major pushback from consumers and restaurant owners. Many arguing against the banning of outdoor dining, claiming that there is no evidence outdoor dining has in any way contributed to the recent surge. Outdoor dining is safe, um, generally safe. Our servers never have direct contact with, with our customers. We know we always have our mask on. But it's not just consumers and business owners unhappy with the new order. Sheriff's departments across the state are protesting their role in enforcing lockdown measures. The Riverside County Sheriff's Department will not be blackmailed, bullied, or used as muscle against Riverside County residents in the enforcement of the governor's orders. The regional stay-at-home order is currently set to continue for the next three weeks, after which the state will assess if there is a need for continuation. For Chapman News, I'm Spencer Riley. Thanks, Spencer. Top health experts warn of a sharp increase in cases as people gather to celebrate the holidays. And Christmas will look very different this year. Even Santa and his helpers had to make some changes. Barbara Fox has more on how Santa's staying safe. Santa and his elves are keeping up with everyone virtually all the way from the North Pole. While you may not be able to see him in person, he's still offering a special treat. They get a tour of the North Pole and there's no other way for them to tour the North Pole because the North Pole Santa's Village is a magic place. If it weren't for these interwebs that we just got at the North Pole recently, they would never be able to see what's going on up here. You, you know who I am? Santa. Yeah, of course, exactly. St. Nick says that these effects are here to stay, changing how he makes his future visits. In the future, the children will want uh, a, a virtual tour, a more interactive personal experience with Santa himself. And um, I think it's going to be, I, I think the virtual visitation is going to be here to stay. Santa and his elves are also social distancing and masking up this holiday season. While Santa is making virtual visits, he's also made another appearance at Bass Pro Shop, where you'll still feel the magic from behind the plexiglass wall. Ho, ho, ho! Tacky Burner is one of the lucky people who got to speak with Santa. There was like a Santa's village that was separated and someone kind of greeted you and did your temperature and it was limited. So like you had to pick a certain time slot. So they wanted to limit the amount of people that would be there. And then Santa's kind of just sitting behind the plexiglass. <laughs> Despite her experience being different, she's still glad her family had the opportunity to meet Santa. It was really funny. We had a lot of laughs. My son didn't care. There's like an image of him like putting his hand up the plexiglass and like Santa's doing it too. Um, it was very 2020. But don't worry, a little elf told me that Santa will still be going down the chimney to deliver gifts and Christmas cheer. But only if you're playing nice and staying safe. For Chapman News, I'm Barbara Fox. Thanks, Barbara. With everyone staying home this holiday season, reports show a significant increase in Christmas tree sales this year. Erin Coogan has the story. That's right, Sophie. Tis the season, the season of a quarantined Christmas, that is. Although many holiday traditions have been turned upside down because of the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm here at the Pinery Christmas Tree Farm to see what they're doing to keep this holiday season merry and bright. For over 25 years, the Pinery Tree Company has been the source of many Christmas memories. From scouring the aisles to finally picking the perfect tree, a visit is more like a holiday rite of passage than a chore. Um, you know, traditionally, you know, we, uh, you know, day after Thanksgiving is busy, but it was really super busy. I think because of the COVID, people want to get there early and it's a kind of a good feel to get a home, get the families together, decorate their trees. National sales data reveals a 29% increase in Christmas tree sales this holiday season. 
leaving many to speculate that this is in hopes of combating the COVID blues. Even California's latest restrictions aren't stopping people from picking out a Christmas tree. You know, we still get pretty good business. A lot of families come in with their kids that's been home all day studying, want to get them out of the house, just kind of walk around. And with proper precaution and diligent protocol, there's no reason not to ring in the season with a little bit of Christmas spirit. I don't know, we've had zero issues. We've had zero cases. We all wear, you know, gloves, protective wear. Uh, we have sanitized stations all over. Uh, we, we sanitize as much as we can, and we just try to be safe. Due to the outdoor nature of most Christmas tree lots, even with tightening COVID restrictions, there's no sign that these guys are going to close anytime soon. So get your holiday started. Head on over to your local tree lot. I'm actually going to check out this tree right now. I'm Aaron Coogan for Chapman News. It's hard to believe that we've spent almost a year navigating life during the pandemic. But one teenager is determined to commemorate COVID-19 with a big birthday bash. Melissa Cho has the story. If you're a teenager or Gen Z Facebook user, chances are you've seen a COVID birthday party event floating around at some point. Created by 18-year-old Australian Hugo McQuillan, the event has amassed almost a million responses. In the About section, McQuillan writes, Let's give a toast and the middle finger to COVID-19. It started off between a joke between me and my mum. Um, it was a joke that I had said in the car going, imagine if someone did a birthday party for COVID-19. McQuillan whipped up a design on Photoshop in 20 minutes and started inviting his high school friends. But little did he know that the RSVPs just kept coming in. Definitely in that third day, I reckon, it went from like 2,000 to like 10,000 overnight. And I was like, hold on. He'll also be making sure that this birthday bash doesn't come off as insensitive taking this opportunity to show solidarity for those affected by COVID-19 and bringing a bit of joy into people's lives. This sort of style of humor is quite common in Australia where everyone kind of looks at a messed up situation or something that's quite sort of like quite horrible and we go, well, let's sort of make light of that and kind of joke around it, but also not try and disrespect it. McQuillan will also be fundraising for Beyond Blue, an Australian mental health support organization, and Minus 18, a charity group aimed at helping local LGBTQ youth. And maybe we'll see you online next Friday. Reporting for Chapman News, I'm Melissa Cho. No matter how you choose to commemorate the virus's birthday, don't forget to social distance and wear a mask. Presidential pardoning underway. Can Trump pardon himself? How are your favorite tourist spots coping? From Vegas casinos to ski resorts in Colorado. All that and more coming up on Chapman News. Three months ago, there weren't enough masks. We were desperately sourcing from all over the world. People were making face coverings from scarves, bandanas, and bits of fabric. Now there are plenty of masks, but some people don't want to wear them. Come on. Mask up, America. The Federal Trade Commission sued Facebook in an antitrust lawsuit on Wednesday. The plaintiffs alleging that the company illegally maintains its monopoly by engaging in anti-competitive behavior. The FTC wants an injunction to divest Facebook's assets, including Instagram and WhatsApp. Meanwhile, FTC Director Ian Connor says personal social networking is central to the lives of millions of Americans. As President-elect Biden picks out his cabinet, President Trump is still claiming he won the election. This despite a major Supreme Court blow. Jasmine Sani has the political update. Jasmine? Thank you, Safi. As President Trump continues his unsuccessful legal battles, the courts are coming closer to Chapman than ever before. Chapman law professor John Eastman is now representing the president in another bid before the Supreme Court. Generating widespread community embarrassment, 97 faculty members have signed onto a statement denouncing Eastman's legal action. Chapman President Daniele Strupa issued a statement yesterday saying that although Eastman used his Chapman email and phone number in the brief, 
The university is not affiliated with Eastman's Supreme Court case. I'd rather not be in a controversy every other week if I can avoid it, but uh, it is what it is. You know, people uh, have their independent ability. You know, as an attorney, he's free to, to, to accept whatever clients he think he should accept. But uh, um, I, I wish he hadn't uh, used our name as his address and his email and everything. Strupa told the Panther that Eastman will remove his university credentials from the Supreme Court filings. This is the second time the professor has come under fire for his political opinions. The first was when he questioned Vice President-elect Kamala Harris's eligibility for her incoming position. Eastman is currently on leave of absence from Chapman and is teaching at the University of Colorado Boulder. It's been over a month since Joe Biden won the 2020 presidential election but only 27 congressional Republicans have acknowledged his victory. There are currently 249 Republicans in the House and Senate, meaning about 88% will not say who won the election. Despite this, 106 Republican members of Congress signed onto an amicus brief yesterday, calling for the Supreme Court to overturn election results in Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, all of which Joe Biden won. And the House of Representatives has overwhelmingly passed a defense bill on Tuesday that the president pledges to veto. This year's agenda for military spending includes provisions to remove the names of Confederate generals from military bases and adds protections for big tech companies like Twitter and Facebook, both of which Trump is opposed to. And on Tuesday, the president tweeted, quote, I hope House Republicans will vote against the very weak National Defense Authorization Act, which I will veto. However, lawmakers note with pride the NDAA's passage for 59 straight years. The chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Adam Smith, said in a statement, quote, Today the House sent a strong bipartisan message to the American people. Our service members and our national security are more important than politics. The Senate is expected to vote on the bill this week. President-elect Joe Biden will travel to Georgia next week to help campaign for Democratic candidates John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock. The Georgia Senate runoffs are on January 5th, and this race will determine whether Democrats have a majority in the Senate. Meanwhile, President Trump and the GOP continue to drive their election fraud narrative. This comes after multiple recounts show Trump's loss in the state. While it's become a presidential tradition to sign pardons at the end of an administration, President Trump is considering an unusually high number of pardons involving his closest friends, aides, and family members. Jenna Perry has the story. Pardoning season is underway as President Trump enters into the home stretch of his administration. But this year, the constitutional limit of the pardoning power will be put to the test. Many expect Trump to pardon himself, which is constitutionally uncharted territory. Chapman professor Dr. John Compton says there's no consensus within the legal field. A lot of law professors today will argue that the president can pardon themselves since the language of the Constitution doesn't forbid it. Um, others will argue that, you know, it violates basic principles of, you know, English and American law that were understood at the time the Constitution was founded. A common principle at the time was that a person cannot be a judge in their own case. A self-pardon would violate that principle. With no precedent to rely on, scholars look back on history. Compton says the last time a self-pardon power was considered was in the 1970s under Richard Nixon. Uh, before he resigned, uh, someone in the Office of Legal Counsel within the White House issued a memo uh, with the opinion that the president does not have the power to pardon himself. But that memo is not, it's not binding. A source familiar with the matter telling CNN Trump is considering preemptively pardoning his lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, his three eldest children, and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. The basic principle there is that you would be pardoning someone for a crime they have not yet been convicted of and possibly not even yet charged with. But the courts seem to have held that presidents do have the power to preemptively pardon someone. The Department of Justice is investigating whether there was a scheme to funnel money to the White House or a political committee in exchange for a presidential pardon. 
No names were revealed in the heavily redacted federal court documents. But the power to pardon cannot save Trump or his associates from all litigation, as presidential pardons only apply to federal crimes. According to Justice Department data, Trump uses the pardoning power significantly less than other modern presidents. He has issued 29 pardons and 16 commutations, the fewest of any president within the last 100 years. But Trump's pardons are unprecedented in a distinct way. There have always been kind of politically charged pardons. Those are not new. What I think is new about Trump is that most of his pardons, when he's issued them, you know, his message is not, you know, this person was guilty, their sentence was too harsh, or they've done their time, so I think they should, have, they should go home and be with their families. His message is always, you know, this this charge was a sham. This person should have never been put in jail. Uh, it was a crooked prosecution. For Chapman News, I'm Jenna Perry. Thank you, Jenna. Hunter Biden, the president-elect's son, is confirming that he's under federal investigation for his business dealings in China. He says that he will fully cooperate. And the vice president-elect himself is making big plans for his presidency, announcing he will sign a nationwide mask mandate and fund schools so they can safely teach kids in person. Among those on his coronavirus and healthcare team are Dr. Anthony Fauci, who will serve as Biden's chief medical advisor, California Attorney General Javier Becerra as Biden's Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Vivek Murthy as Surgeon General of the United States, and Dr. Rochelle Walensky as the Director of the CDC. Although us Chapman students are about to go on break, the world of politics never does. Thank you for sticking with us this semester. I'm Jasmine Sani. Back to you, Safi. The U.S. Army has suspended or fired 14 officers and enlisted soldiers from its Fort Hood base in Texas. The Army now calling for policy changes to address failures in leadership that contributed to the widespread violence, including murder, sexual assault, and harassment. Coming up on Chapman News, something to brighten up a dark time. All you have to do is look up. And your 2020 sports wrap-up coming next. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. As it turns out, we have very similar personalities. And this cat makes me make art because he's always motivating me to take pictures of him, to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. It's just that simple. Well, he's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Winter is finally here, but for ski lovers everywhere, this season's restrictions are quite frigid. Nicole Zedek reports from Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Ski season is finally here, but as people buckle down their boots, they will also have to pull up their mask. Ski resorts and mountains are implementing new COVID restrictions that are changing the way you hit the slopes. You come down, come down on the mountain pretty tired and then you got to go through the gondola and you got to put your mask on. At that point, it's actually kind of tough to breathe. Skiers and snowboarders must follow regular COVID guidelines, such as wearing a mask and staying socially distant. This means longer lift lines as gondolas and chairlifts are reduced to those in your household. And lift lines, yeah, they're going to be a little bit longer because people just can't spread out on the slopes right now. Many ski areas, including all of California's resorts, will no longer sell same-day tickets and instead require lift tickets to be pre-purchased online. Some mountains are also requiring a reservation even if you have a season pass. But these restrictions are not deterring avid skiers and boarders. I feel pretty safe. I've n I haven't seen anyone like without a mask or anything. The COVID guidelines, you know, it's keeping the mountain open, so I enjoy it. For those planning on hitting the slopes this holiday season, make sure to check what specific COVID guidelines are in place at your mountain. Reporting from Steamboat Springs, Colorado, I'm Nicole Zedek for Chapman News. We've seen many changes in the sports world this year. With your 2020 wrap-up is Erin Coogan. What a year it has been. School, sports, life, all turned on its head. But before we wrap up this semester and head into a hopefully brighter new year, let's take a look back at what I call a little Chapman Sports twist on a 2020 year in review. 
For the final time, I'm Erin Coogan, and welcome back to the Best Campus Sports Show. January had us jumping up and down with the expectation of another great year of sports. We dove right into February, business as usual, breaking records and celebrating some big athletic accomplishments. That is until March came around and really said, not today, the coronavirus forcing a campus-wide shutdown and the cancellation of all remaining spring sports. April left us with our hands up in the air wondering what else could go wrong. Little did we know this was just the beginning. May rolled around with June chasing close behind and in July we demanded answers. In August we returned to campus with high hopes of a fresh start and a new season. But September said hold up as the athletic department worked to devise a safe reopening plan. October marked the beginning of socially distant team practices while November came as a slap in the face and all fall and winter sports were permanently canceled for the 2021 season. And finally, we make it to December. Although athletics continues to fight what seems to be a losing battle, we remain optimistic. As of now, spring sports are expected to return on February 1st. The season will consist of local and in-conference play only with COVID protocol being updated regularly. Fall and winter athletes will be granted an additional year of eligibility to make up for this past season and will also be allowed to train with their coaches in the spring, COVID permitting. Making our way to national sports, the Big Ten has eliminated its six-game requirement, paving the way for Ohio State to face Northwestern in the conference championship. Prior to the eligibility change announced this past Wednesday, the Indiana Hoosiers were slated to represent the Big Ten East after cancellation of the upcoming Ohio State versus Michigan matchup would lead to Ohio's appearance in only five games. Also released on Wednesday was a statement from the league that read, quote, The decision was based on a competitive analysis, which determined that Ohio State would have advanced to the Big Ten football championship game based on its undefeated record and head-to-head -head victory over Indiana, regardless of a win or loss against Michigan. Ohio State will take on Northwestern at Lucas Oil Stadium on December 19th. And big news coming from the Olympics organization. In addition to the newest sports of rock climbing, surfing, skateboarding, karate, baseball, and softball making their Olympic debut in Tokyo 2021, breakdancing will also join the lineup in Paris's 2024 competition. Announced this past Monday, the addition of breakdancing or breaking has been made in an effort to support the Olympics' recent initiative to feature more youth-focused events. The 2024 Games will also be the first Olympic competition to host 100% gender equality. This means the same amount of female athletes will be competing as their male counterparts. This year's undoubtedly been one to remember. The coronavirus has changed everything we've ever known about sports locally and worldwide. But alongside all the lows have come some amazing highs. Increased diversity measures and female representation continue to challenge what is possible in the world of athletics. And now with your local and national weather updates is Nicole Zedek. Thanks for an amazing semester. I'm Erin Coogan. Thanks, Erin. This Sunday, we can expect to see one of the best meteor showers of the year. The Geminid shower will start around 9 p.m., but will peak in the middle of the night around 2 a.m. when you can expect to see up to 120 meteors per hour. Plus, this Sunday is a moonless night, so the stars will shine extra bright. Now, it may be chillier while you're watching those shooting stars, but during the day here in Orange, the high is a pleasant 64 degrees, and it will actually be warming up throughout the week. But before I get to our local forecast, let's see what's happening around the country. Up in Seattle, Washington, it is 45 degrees with showers that you can expect throughout the week. Over in Colorado, which is where I currently am, the high is 30, and we can finally expect some snow that will also be continuing throughout the weekend. Up in Chicago, Illinois, the high is 44, and you can also expect some showers there, but just through today. And if you're going over to New York, the high is 55. And contrasting that down in Miami, Florida, the high is a pleasant 77 degrees. Now checking out our local Orange County forecast, kind of cooler temperatures throughout all of Orange County. Warmest here in, in Orange with 64 degrees. It is 62 in Westminster, Irvine, and Mission Viejo. And if you're planning on heading to the beach today, it is 61 degrees, so definitely a little bit cooler, so I would recommend bringing a jacket. Now looking at our local orange seven-day forecast, it's partly cloudy today and tomorrow, but the sun will come out on Sunday, and it will be much warmer with 76 degrees. Then Monday, it's going to cool down a bit again and be partly cloudy, but the sun will be back Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with a high of 74 and 73.
Now that is your weekly look ahead at the weather. I'm Nicole Zedek, and don't forget to check out that meteor shower on Sunday. Now last week is shut down. How is the entertainment hub coping? Coming up on Chapman News. They call me Maxi, but I prefer tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. Thinking of going to Vegas anytime soon? That might be a bigger gamble than you bargained for. Shutdowns and spikes have caused the entertainment hub to lose millions of dollars. Coletno has the story. COVID-19 cases continue to spike around the world. But in Nevada, a statewide pause has increased restrictions for Las Vegas. Table games are only three people now, not six. Bars are every other seat. And then ballrooms, so all of our conventions are 40 people max. Due to the limited capacity, tourism has been down around 71% compared to last year. The owner of 10 resorts on the Strip reported a 66% decrease in revenue. Crawcheck says Las Vegas is desperate to make money. Well, in terms of our reservations, room rate, conventions, concerts, all that kind of stuff, I mean, we have plummeted. We are bringing in basically no money. As a solution, room rates have been lowered to as low as $40 per night. And Krawcheck says the demographic of tourists to Las Vegas has completely changed. Well, you're used to seeing people in Vegas just spending money like crazy with no regard to anything. And now you have a lot of penny pinchers down here that get very angry when you expect them to gamble. And so it's definitely been interesting adjusting to the new clientele that the prices are bringing in. And entertainment in Las Vegas has been upended. Cirque du Soleil recently filed for bankruptcy and was forced to cut 3,500 jobs. Mark Paletti, former Las Vegas actor and stuntman, said his live action show Run had just premiered in November of last year. Then the pandemic hit. You know, for them to shut us down so quick, it was like, it's very confusing, especially how much money they spent on it. I mean, they spent like $60 million on our show. Friends from Russia and France and Australia, like for them to give up their whole life to move to Vegas to perform. Personally, it was like, I didn't know what to do. As a result, Paletti moved back to Los Angeles to work in post-production and focus on writing instead. You know, I have all the time in the world right now, so it's a lot of like deep diving into, you know, how to write stories and, you know, maybe one day write a Cirque show or, or a film. Like many cities around the world, Las Vegas is trying to balance the risks of COVID-19 with the long-term implications of unemployment for the tourism industry. According to Fitch Ratings, a full Las Vegas recovery won't likely happen until 2024, but Las Vegans hope it happens a lot sooner than that. I'm Colette Ngo for Chapman News. While entertainment in Vegas may be put on hold, the show must go on at Chapman News. Here with your final entertainment report for the semester is Maddie Fabricant. Maddie? Hello everyone and welcome back to this semester's last week in entertainment. I'm your host, Maddie Fabricant. It's been a big week for music. With what many are calling a landmark agreement, Bob Dylan sold his entire catalog of music to Universal Music Publishing Group this week. Bloomberg News estimates the sale at more than $300 million, giving Universal the rights to Dylan's music for the next 60 years. And that wasn't the only surprise in music this week, as there is more good news for you Swifties out there, with Taylor Swift announcing yesterday a new album. Dropping yesterday, Evermore is the singer's ninth studio album and what she calls a sister record to her last album, folklore. Fans are elated at the latest drop and to quote Swift herself, she just couldn't stop writing songs. And some familiar not so great news as well. Popular talk show host Ellen DeGeneres announcing yesterday that she has contracted the coronavirus. Ellen took to social media to make the announcement where she said she's following all the proper CDC guidelines. 
We hope that she makes a speedy recovery. More backlash for Warner Brothers following their streaming announcement last week. Blindsiding many in the industry, the company announced its entire 2021 film slate will be releasing in both theaters and on HBO Max. Director Christopher Nolan is among those criticizing the company, calling it a bad business decision. Nolan, who saw disappointing box office returns for his last film, Tenet, has been very vocal of his disapproval, even calling HBO Max the worst streaming service in a statement to The Hollywood Reporter. While the film industry is taking quite a hit, TV fans are feeling quite euphoric after hit TV show Euphoria released a special episode on HBO and HBO Max. The show is back with two special episodes after its season two was halted due to the pandemic. You all better mark your calendars because the latest special, co-produced and co-written by star Hunter Schaefer, will debut at 9 p.m. on January 24th, 2021. And though Broadway may be closed until May of 2021, the dream of many TikToker alike is coming true. Theater geeks and professionals have come together on TikTok to create a full socially distanced musical about Disney and Pixar's film, Ratatouille. It all started when TikTok user Emily Jacobson made a video, Ode to Remy, the rat from Ratatouille, the video quickly gaining a fan base. Everyone who has been following this musical's conception, Ratatouille, the TikTok musical special, will be available to stream on Today Ticks from the 1st of January to benefit the Actors Fund. And finally, as the longest year of our lives is finally coming to an end, we wanted to look back on the many television shows and films that helped us through this pandemic. The Chapman News crew was more than excited to share their favorites. And we have to start with the docu-series that took the whole world by storm in the beginning of the pandemic. Hey all you cool cats and kittens, can you believe that Tiger King came out on March 20th? Can you believe that March is basically three months away? I certainly can't. Chapman News professor Brett Marcus picks Netflix hit series The Crown to be his favorite, whereas our executive producer Jackie Gold fell for a different type of queen, also on Netflix, The Queen's Gambit. Our other executive producer, Satvi Sankara, spent the little time she had binging Hulu's Little Fires Everywhere, and show editor AJ Keenan says he could have not gotten through the summer without Hamilton or Avatar The Last Airbender. International correspondent Melissa Cho couldn't stop her feelings about Trolls World Tour, while politics producer Jenna Perry braved the theaters to see Tenet. As for me, I'm a documentary girl, and some of my favorites of the year include Netflix's Jeffrey Epstein, Filthy Rich, Hulu's Totally Under Control, and although not a documentary, Netflix's latest season of Big Mouth. And finally, we cannot wrap up this year without noting the films and shows that brought attention to the systemic racism in the U.S. In the wake of Black Lives Matter, these include Ava DuVernay's 13th, I Am Not Your Negro, Just Mercy, The Trial of the Chicago 7, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, among many, many others. As the entertainment producer this semester, I want to thank all of you for a really incredible run. It was an honor writing, reporting, editing, and learning for all of you. Thank you. Back to you, Safi. Thanks, Maddie. Like everything this year, holiday celebrations are looking quite different. One baseball team took it upon themselves to spread a little holiday cheer. And boy, did they hit a home run. Sarah Tabaris has the story. This year, there truly is no place like home for the holidays. But if you're looking to go out safely, look no further than the Dodger Stadium. The 2020 World Champions are hosting a drive-through holiday festival to put you in the Christmas spirit. 
The show will go on every night till December 24th, celebrating various traditions of Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa. Everyone is welcome to the lights, whether you're a fan of the team or not. As you drive through, you will encounter light tunnels, cactus Christmas trees, snow, unicorns, elves, Santa Claus, Merry Christmas, and even an Elton John lookalike singing on stage in his glitzy Dodger uniform. Two hearts are thrilling in spite of the chilling. And since it's a Dodger party after all, fans will also drive by Dodger themed displays throughout the loop. As many try to end 2020 on a positive note, celebrating with the Dodgers might be a home run for us all. The festival will continue through Christmas Eve from 5 to 10 p.m. You can visit the event by going online to their website, dodgers.com slash holiday festival. I'm Sarah Tabares for Chapman News. Back to you, Sappy. Thanks, Sarah. We're celebrating another event this month, graduation. Our Chapman News seniors, including myself, took a look back at the last four years. So the biggest skills that I'm taking away from Chapman News is I feel like I know how to be a part of a team now more than ever, knowing that we can all pull together a show even if we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's always guidance from, you know, Brett, Jackie, Sophie, the entire Chapman News team, but I think that this was very much like a self-starting effort and I learned a lot. I'm really thankful and I'm really happy that I was able to do it, even if it was online this semester. I want to give a shout out to our editors, AJ and Sienna, for staying up all night and then helping us with all those glitches. You guys rock. It is so much time and so much effort, and because of that, you really bond with all of the different people and when you're stressing out after all of the hours that you put in you know that your Chapman News family still has your back. I'm here by myself in Vegas. It gets lonely and now I know that I have 14 other people in the glass that I can turn to. I think what I will miss most about Chapman News is that it is the most community I have ever felt at Chapman. Right now, I'm interning for CNBC, which is really awesome that I've been able to have the experience to intern for CNBC and then a report as the business and technology producer for Chapman News at the same time. So I feel like Chapman News really let me delve into this world of business and technology reporting, which I really never had the chance to. Before, I didn't realize that you were actually supposed to love what you're doing. And so once I've taken all my classes and realized how much fun I was having, I knew that I was in the right place and I knew that this is what I would want to be doing for the rest of my life. Having never done this before, I think we all did a good job in, you know, keeping sane and producing a show we're all proud of. On behalf of all our Chapman News seniors, a big thank you for putting that together. And thank you for tuning in. It's been an honor to serve as an executive producer for all of 2020. I wouldn't have wanted to ride this wave with anyone besides our Chapman News team and you, our viewers. So don't forget to follow us on social media at Chapman News and subscribe to our YouTube channel at chapmannews.tv. I'm Sati Sankara. We'll be back in the spring but in the meantime, have a wonderful break and happy holidays. Yeah.